ADHD continues to be controversial in, in some, people's, um, some people's mind. It's a common disorder, around 5% of children. The core symptoms, hyperactivity, impulsivity, and overactivity are not enough on their own to give you ADHD. Those symptoms need to be impairing. And indeed, when they're there, they are very impairing. Why fidgety Philip? Well, ADHD is not a new disorder. Henrik Hoffmann, mid-19th century, wrote a book of nursery rhymes, really, and they included the story of fidgety Philip, who very clear description of the hyperactive, impulsive, and disruptive parts of, um, of ADHD. And this has become something that you'll see at the beginning of almost all ADHD talks. But what people don't remember is in the same book, Hoffman talked about the stor of story of Johnny Head in the Air. And Johnny Head in the Air, if you read the poem, this is just an extract from it, but if you read the poem, really had many, if not all, of the inattentive parts of ADHD. And now we recognize these occurring together. And as I said, causing huge impairment, not just to the individual, but also to the family, and importantly, to society. Some of the more recent data looking at the impairment um, suggests that twice the risk of substance misuse over twice the risk of being involved in a motor vehicle accident as a child, as a, as a pedestrian, and as an adult, because ADHD does very much continue into adulthood as the driver. 30% of the male prison population in the UK has undiagnosed and untreated ADHD, and the proportion in women's prisons is even higher. Soren Dalsgaard and his group in uh, Denmark looked at the National Register there and in a, a, a Lancet paper last year demonstrated that not only does ADHD cause these morbidities, but it's also associated with very clear risks and increased risks of death, of mortality. Uh, so it's, it's not a condition to be sniffed at. The basic and, and, and traditional causal models, not just for ADHD, but for most of the disorders that we look at, start with genes and environment, they move on into the brain, they look at differences in structure and function, leading to cognitive deficits, which then are thought to lead to symptoms. And I'm going to explore that relationship, and in particular, the relationship between cognition, symptoms, and impairment as part of this talk. Our cognitive work, looking at the neuropsychology and neuropsychopharmacology of ADHD, has really spanned quite a lot of different studies. We've looked at heterogeneity, we've looked at the impact of coexisting disorders, common coexisting disorders like oppositional defiant disorder, conduct disorder, Williams syndrome, a rare genetic disorder, actually with many similarities to ADHD, as well as many differences. And then more recently, we've started to investigate this relationship between cognition, symptoms, and impairment. And it's the first and last of these that I'm going to present some data on today. There's not enough time to talk about all of the aspects. But in addition to that, we've more recently started to look not just at the positive impacts of medications, but also at the potential negative impacts of medication. And that data is not quite yet ready to, to, to present, but has also very much involved testing with the, the Cantab battery. Russell Barclay, one of the greatest showmen in child and adolescent mental health. Um, I'm not al always sure that Russell's the greatest scientist. Um, however, he has a lot of impact and a lot of influence. And this was Russell's um, single cause model that he would say explained the whole of ADHD. And this was very much the model that people look to. That at the cognitive level, the primary deficit was said to be in behavioral inhibition. And it was that problem with behavioural inhibition and not taking enough time to stop and think that he proposed led to the deficits in working memory and other executive functions, which were all seen as secondary. We weren't convinced by that. 
and wanted to have a look to see if we could investigate um, as part of a bigger study. And really, this is our pivotal study and the study from which a lot of our work has come. There were many previous studies that looked at the neuropsychology of ADHD and several studies that had looked at the neuropsychopharmacology of ADHD, but they were beset with problems. Almost everyone had only enrolled children, young people in who had previously had medication and then had withdrawn medication from those subjects to test them. Very few people had actually looked at randomised controlled trials of medication to see the impact on cognition. And almost nobody had looked at the impact of longer term medication, almost all of the studies looking just at single doses. So we designed a study to compare at baseline a group of boys with clear hyperkinetic disorder, severe pervasive impairing ADHD, to a group of healthy controls. We then had an acute challenge, randomized, double-blind, two doses versus placebo with methylphenidate, and then shifted into a four times three, a three times four week randomized trial of, again, methylphenidate low and high dose versus placebo so that we could look not just at the cognitive effects, but also at the clinical impact of medication. When we look at the baseline, and as I said, we use Cantab as the tool to investigate cognitive functioning, and we used, um, at the time, most of the Cantab tasks that we felt were relevant. And as you'll see from here, across the executive tasks, and the non-executive tasks, we found really moderate to large effect sizes for all of these different aspects of cognitive functioning. Really one of the novel parts of the study was to say not just, ADHD is not just a disorder of executive functioning, but actually the non-executive aspects of functioning are as much and in some cases, particularly for tasks like delayed matching to sample and pattern recognition, the strongest effects, not only the strongest effects with respect to effect size, but if you look down the right-hand column, the tasks on which the greatest proportion of those with ADHD had a deficit. If you focus on that proportion of those that had a deficit on any particular task. The first thing I'm sure you'll notice is that no task was ubiquitous. There was no task on which everybody demonstrated a deficit. And in fact, the proportions were really relatively low. We'll come back to that from a second study that we looked at and look at it in more detail. We were interested particularly in memory we found deficits on executive functioning, on spatial working memory. But importantly, those deficits were not linked to problems with inhibition. We were able to find no association between inhibitory performance and spatial working memory. But for us, it was more interesting to have found these deficits in non-executive memory particularly on the delayed matching to sample task, where we found a delay-dependent deficit that actually was identical to the deficits that Barbara and her colleagues had found in Alzheimer's and that Trevor and colleagues had found in Cambridge undergraduates given scopolamine. So actually suggesting to us that ADHD is not just a uh, disorder of, of frontal lobe functioning, but probably also includes aspects of amygdalo hippocampal or temporal lobe functioning and is not just related to the dopaminergic system, but possibly also the cholinergic system. And interestingly, in our acute challenge, those deficits, very striking deficits on uh, delayed matching to sample, were completely obliterated by a single dose of methylphenidate medication. Fascinating finding. So that leads us to think that ADHD possibly is a bit more complex than Russell Barclay had suggested. And indeed, others since that time have gone on to study other aspects of cognitive functioning, and we really get a very complex potential picture here.
One of the difficulties was that all of these deficits in various aspects of functioning had been shown separately in separate studies. So with Sarah Seth and Keith Matthews, we designed a study to again look at drug-naive boys with ADHD and look at them across that wide range of cognitive functioning. And again, what we found in memory, inhibition, delay aversion, decision-making, timing, and variability, significant impact on all of these aspects of functioning, but again, only a proportion with each of those deficits. And that the correlations and associations between those factors were generally not significant, and where significant, were very small. Looking at the pattern of deficits in any one individual, we find that the variability is very great. And again, many didn't have a deficit on any, even though we'd used that very broad battery. So just to conclude with some other data now on interrelationship between cognition, symptoms, and impairment. Again, that traditional model. If that's the case, we would expect um, that when a treatment improves cognition, it should also reduce symptoms. When a treatment reduces symptoms, it should have reduced cognition, improved cognition. And if they change over time, they should change in over time together. And we were able to use the data from our chronic study to look at that. And actually, what we found was that whilst we showed very clear benefits on cognition of methylphenidate, and whilst we showed very clear benefits on symptoms, none of those were associated with each other. There was no correlation between the impact on symptoms and the impact on cognition. Trevor challenged me the last time he saw this to put all of those cognitive um, aspects in one factor, a general cognitive factor, and I've done that, Trevor. And as you'll see, whilst we found a marginally significant but still very low correlation, really I think it still holds that whilst methylphenidate improves cognition and reduces uh, symptoms, those two are only weakly associated. And the last piece of data I'll show you is to have then looked over time at that same group of children. So looking at the development over a four-year period when we saw improvement in symptoms, we again saw improvement in cognition on most aspects, but the only significant correlation between improved symptomatology and improved cognition was interestingly, again, for the delayed matching to sample task. And that correlation, again, was not huge, hugely, um, hugely high. So our hypothesis for the meaning of this is that possibly this traditional linear model of um, causality could be replaced where, rather than in series, Cognition and symptoms may be in parallel. It's not to say they are not related to each other, but that they do not necessarily always mediate each other's, um, each other's effects. And this is borne out, actually, by data from treatment literature, because we find, actually, that um, when you look at working memory training, for example, we can demonstrate that working memory training improves working memory in ADHD. But working memory training has very little, if any, effect on ADHD symptoms. And the question then becomes, should you use working memory training or similar kinds of training in ADHD? Many of my clinical colleagues say, no, it doesn't work on ADHD symptoms. Don't use it. But of course, if it's improving impairment, not necessarily through symptoms, then it still may have a benefit. And really our challenge for the future is, I think, to get better measurements of impairment, to look at the impact of cognition on impairment, not just through symptoms. And I plan, I hope to do that when moving to Melbourne, by looking at a new, improved and expanded battery of tasks joined up with real-time data capture techniques, augmented by better measurements of impairment and environmental um, situational factors, and then collect longitudinal data that both looks at the impact of development and hopefully treatment, supplemented by a range 
of other, um, uh, other approaches. Thank you.